Please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I'd encourage you to keep your Bibles open with me as we go through this passage together this afternoon. Matthew chapter 18. We're going to beginning, be beginning in verse 21. I'm going to read through till the end of verse 35. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owned him, who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him. He canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This, Jesus said, is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from the heart. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know about you, but I love Christmas time. There's a lot I love about it. There are the lights. There are the presents. Kids, I bet you get excited about presents at Christmas time. I still get excited about uh, presents at Christmas time. But Christmas is an exciting time. It's a, a time where people seem a little bit different. It's not just the outward things we can say, but it actually seems that people are different. I don't know about you and the traditions that you have, but in our family we have traditions from different nations. Our family grew up for many years. Many of my children were born in Mexico. We love the Spanish side of Christmas still to this day, even though we've been back for a number of years. I'm sure that many of you have Traditions that you have practiced for many years. You play games, perhaps. You get together as a family. You have different special foods that you eat. But everybody has their own tradition at Christmas, and it's great, isn't it? But if you are a Christian this afternoon, Christmas isn't just about the outward things. It's not just about the traditions that we enjoy. But for each Christian... Christmas is much more significant. Christmas is a time when we think about our Savior, we think about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It's a time when we think about his miraculous birth and the events that surround how he came to this earth. Many times in our churches we take many weeks to think about these things year after year after year. They're that important to us, that precious to us. But brothers and sisters, Christmas really is a time when we celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ, not just his birth, but also his life and his work. Christmas is about the peace that God the Father brought through sending his son, Jesus Christ, to this world to save his people from their sins. And brothers and sisters, that peace that we experience as Christians is what we want to talk about this afternoon. A, a special peace, the peace that we have with God and the peace that we have with each other. And this afternoon, we're looking at not a Christmas passage at all, specifically, but we're looking at a passage, Matthew chapter 18, that speaks about our relationship with the Lord and our relationship with others. And the title that I've given the message this afternoon is The Power of Forgiveness. The Power of Forgiveness. In the context of Matthew 18, no doubt you may be familiar with. If you go back to the beginning of chapter 18, there the disciples were speaking to Jesus about who it was that was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They were discussing it together. They wanted to know this great truth, this important truth in their minds. They, they came to Jesus with this question and he if you remember he called a little child and had that child stand in front of them and he said I tell you the truth unless you change and become like little children you will never enter the kingdom of heaven Jesus was teaching about the humility that was necessary for the Christian to have to understand their need for the Lord Jesus goes on to tell a story of the parable of the lost sheep. He then goes into a section where he explains what it is to happen or what is to happen in the church when there is division, when there are problems. He speaks on verse 15 about the brother who sins against you. And this is a passage that we use often in the church, especially when there is division when there is problems, when there are issues that need to be resolved. And we learn there that it's not okay for us to just go after someone when they go after us. When someone speaks against us or someone has something against us, it's not okay for us to lash out against them, is it? It's not an eye for an eye. It's not okay to do what others do to us. Jesus says there in verse 15, he says, if your sin, your brother sins against you, you need to go to him, you need to show him his sin, first of all, just between the two of you. Jesus then goes on to explain that if it doesn't work, if the issue is not resolved in that moment, as it should be, as you should try to do, he says, then you need to take someone else. Someone else has to come alongside you. Someone else has to hear what you are saying so that the two of you might be able to bring the issue to an end, the matter to a close. Jesus then goes on to explain that if it still is not resolved, then it needs to be taken to the church. The leadership in the church need to get involved a matter has to be decided by more than just one or two, but by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And brothers and sisters, we use this passage oftentimes when we have these kind of communications, miscommunications in the church, when we have problems in the church, don't we? 
great steps to take, necessary steps to take, ones that help us resolve issues, ones that help us resolve problems. Now, Peter, no doubt he heard the teaching of Jesus on how to resolve these divisions in the church. Then he came to Jesus with another question. And that's where our passage begins. He asked the questions, Lord, when someone comes against me, when someone sins against me, what is it that I'm to do? Am I to forgive that person seven times? There's no doubt when Peter asked Jesus this question, he was thinking in his mind, well, Jesus certainly is going to think that I'm a very patient and loving person to be able to actually forgive someone seven times in a row. What was the response of Jesus? Jesus said to Peter in verse 21 or 22, he says, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. There are some who would say it's probably not even 77, it's 7 times 70, 490 times. Either way, what Jesus is saying is, look, forgiveness is not just to happen a few times, but the Christian needs to understand that they are called to continually forgive. If we're honest, brothers and sisters, we know that this is not an easy thing. All of us in our life have had times when we have come to an impasse, when we have come to a point where we feel that we're not able to continue any relationship with a person. Especially at Christmas time, there are many who begin to think about those broken relationships that were not resolvable. And even as Christians, we understand that it is a very difficult thing to forgive someone from the heart. This is not a light thing Jesus is talking about. This is not something that's superficially done. And in order to understand, and to understand this passage well, we need to understand that Jesus tells this story about the servant and the king in order to make it crystal clear exactly what he was teaching. So Jesus begins, he says, well, there was a king, a king who was drawing his accounts to a close. He was going through the books and he began to realize that there was a problem That there was a servant of his that was responsible for much of his possessions. A servant that was not managing his money very well. It says in our passage that this servant owed a great deal of money. Many thousands of talents of gold. And when you try and put a figure on this, brothers and sisters, we don't know exactly how much this was, but it's almost an immeasurable amount. It's a a huge amount. And it says the king called this man in. He called him in to give account for how he had spent that money, how there was this deficit in the books. And it says that this man basically had no answers. We don't know what kind of business he was in. We don't know how he was able to misspend this amount of money. But simply he was not able to give an answer to the king that was satisfactory. And verse 25 says, Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had be sold to repay that debt. The servant, of course, was devastated by this news, not surprised 
But devastated, he knew what it meant to be sold into slavery. This was something that was common in those days. And it says in verse 26 that this servant fell on his knees. He cried out to the king. He said, be patient with me and I will pay back everything. And verse 27 gives the response of the good king. The king, it says, took pity on him, had compassion on him. He understood the dire straits that this servant was in. It says that he canceled the debt and he let this man go. And we can only imagine how this servant felt knowing that he had owed all of this money, an immeasurable amount of money, yet the king had pity on him. What a, a relief to know that your wife and children would not be sold into slavery. But our passage, brothers and sisters, in the story that Jesus tells shows that this gratitude that was in the heart of the servant wasn't very deep. Verse 29 says that when the servant went out, he did what? Well, it says that he went out, he found one of his fellow servants, that is, someone who was just like him. Someone who owed him a hundred denarii. When you compare the amount of money here, brothers and sisters, it's a vast difference. We're talking millions of dollars compared to a few cents. It says he found that servant, that fellow servant, he grabbed him around the neck. He said, pay back what you owe to me. Obviously forgetting everything he had just received, everything that the king had done for him, the kind words that had been spoken to him. And it's interesting, his fellow servant, his friend, says, be patient with me, using the exact same words. He said, be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But this man didn't listen. He refused. It says, instead, he went off, had the man thrown into prison until he could pay that debt in full. Now, not surprisingly, the word got out. The other servants saw what had happened. They went out and they told the king, they said, King, look at what has happened. Look at what this wicked servant has done. And that master immediately called the servant in and he calls him for what he is. He says, you wicked servant, I canceled all of that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? It says that the master was angry with him. He turned him over to the jailers to be tortured that he should, until he should pay back all that he owed. Now, brothers and sisters, as this story comes to an end... It's rather a crash landing, isn't it? It's a sudden, dark ending to an otherwise interesting parable. But Jesus, as the perfect storyteller, what he was doing was making a very strong point. And we need to stop and ask, as we do after every passage of Scripture, we need to ask the question, what is it that Jesus wants us to understand? What is it that Jesus is teaching about forgiveness? What is it that is essential for us to walk away with after we read this parable? And there are five things that I would like to point out to you this afternoon. Five lessons that we can learn from this parable of the ungrateful servant. 
And the first is how much that we have been forgiven. Many times when we think about our own sin, brothers and sisters, many times we tend to take it quite lightly, don't we? Yes, we understand that we are sinners. Yes, we understand that we don't think, do things as we ought. Yet many times we don't fully understand the weight of our sin. In Romans 3.23 it says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, children, you need to understand that this includes every one of us here. Children are sinners. Young people are sinners. Parents are sinners. Pastors are sinners. And in our passage, we see that this debt that the servant owed was 10,000 talents. And what Jesus was explaining through this great sum, this immeasurable sum, was the great debt that each one of us owes to God. The great sin that we have committed before a holy, perfect, just, all-knowing God. I don't know about you, but as you get older you tend to see your sin more and more, don't you? You tend to understand how difficult it is to change. But Jesus here is saying that each one of us has this debt to pay. Each one of us have offended a holy and perfect God. And each one of us needs a Savior that can forgive that great sin. Because the Bible says that every one of us one day will appear to give account before the Lord, won't we? At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every knee. So this afternoon, let me ask you very simply... Have you confessed your sins to the Lord? Do you know what it means to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know what it means to have that weight of your sin on your back released? And if you do not, this afternoon I would invite you to go to Jesus Christ to confess your sins and as 1 John 1 says, he will, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is to say, there is no sin that we have committed that God will not Forgive. There is no sin that we have committed that we can think that God is not able, doesn't have the power to forgive. And I've talked with many people in my life that have said to me, Pastor, you don't know the things that I have done. Pray for me. Maybe God will hear your prayers. Brothers and sisters, that forgiveness is not just for pastors. It's not just for good people. That forgiveness is for everyone who comes humbly to the Lord in confession of sin. So it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. All that matters is the present. So go to the Lord. Confess your sins and he will forgive you. 
So the first thing we can learn is how much we have been forgiven. The second thing is that when we compare the offenses against us in our life to how we have offended God, ours are so much greater. Let me say that again. When we compare the offenses against us by others to how we have offended God, our offenses are much greater. When we look at the passage in the story that Jesus told, we see the attitude of the ungrateful servant very clearly. He had just been forgiven a great deal. He had just had a great sum completely, completely forgiven. Yet he turns around and he finds the closest guy, someone at his own level, and he puts his hands around him and begins to choke him because he hasn't paid him a few cents back to him. And when we look at our own lives, brothers and sisters, when we look at our own problems with people and the offenses that have been committed against us, so often we have that same attitude, don't we? We forget about the gracious God that has forgiven us many, many times. And we tend to focus on that one insignificant detail, that one small thing. And we can't get it out of our head. We can't leave it alone. We feel like we have to go after that person. And Jesus' words are so clear. They're so revealing to us, aren't they? And brothers and sisters, when there are divisions and when there is sin against us, we need to ask ourselves, am I remembering the things that God has forgiven me for? Even this thing that, this offense against me, is this so great that I'm not able to, to speak with that person about it? I'm not able to resolve this problem? One of the things that was so sad in the time of COVID was to hear stories of those who were apart from their family and they were saying goodbye over a ventilator on, on a screen and even when they had the opportunity to resolve the problems they didn't think it was that important until they realized that they were in the process of dying and suddenly they began to reach out. Jesus here is explaining to the church that we are called to forgive. That a gracious, loving God that has saved us and forgiven us from so much now equips us and enables us to begin that forgiveness process with those around us. We need to understand, brothers and sisters, this is not optional. This is not optional. Look at what verse 33 says. It says, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Verse 35, this is how my heavenly father will treat each one of you unless you forgive your brother from the heart. This man had to pay for his sins in the end. The king was just. The king made him see just how wrong he was. Forever he was going to be, have to pay back for the rest of his life. There was no way out for this man now. 
We need to understand as a church that forgiveness is not optional. And this is something that's hard for us to understand, isn't it? It's something that's hard for us to implement, to live out. And for those of you who have children here this afternoon, you know how that is when you teach your kids about forgiveness when there's a spat between the two, when there's a fight going on and you separate them and you say to them, look, you've, you've got to say sorry to each other. I remember my kids saying, I'm sorry, but not really meaning anything that they said. They said it just out of their mouth. It was on their lips, those three words, but really they didn't mean it a bit, and they soon were fighting again. And then I would go back to my kids, and I'd say to my kids, no, no, you got to understand this. You have to understand that you have to say this from the heart. And this is what Jesus here is saying. He's, he's saying, look it, you have to learn to forgive one another. And it's not just words that you say. It's not just a formula that you have. And it's going to all go away. No, you need to do this from your heart. And brothers and sisters, that's not an easy thing to do, is it? Maybe you've had a broken relationship in your life for a long time and you've not been able to resolve it. To go back to that person again, to begin that process again isn't easy. But this is what Christ calls us to. This is the desire that he has for the church. And it's not just forgiving once or twice. It's, again, this concept of 70 times 7 of, of forgiving again and again. Now for us, oftentimes we just want to quit, don't we? I know many times I hear from leaders in churches and they've said to me, this person has offended time and time and time again. What do we do with this person? Pastors sometimes have those who don't agree with them and come after them and criticize them. And as a pastor, it's hard to continue to talk to that person, to continue to forgive that person. In marriage, we know that this is a concept that we need to practice, not just once in a while. This is something that we practice day after day after day. Forgetting the past and going forward, forgiving and keeping on forgiving. So God calls us to understand that forgiveness is not optional. He calls us not to, to understand that it is an ongoing process. It's an ongoing thing that we need to do in sinful human relationships. But we need to understand that fifthly, God desires us to be free from the damage of broken relationships. And when we look at scripture, there's one passage that is so beautiful, Ephesians chapter 4. It says at the end, after an explanation of the work of God in changing a person's life, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were sealed for the day of redemption. It says, get rid of all bitterness rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God has forgiven you. Now how many people today live in broken relationships how many people today are filled with bitterness and rage and anger? If you were to describe our culture today, we would 
perhaps say that it's an angry culture. It's a bitter culture. The point of the message of Jesus is this, that we don't need to stay there. We don't need to stay in those broken relationships. We don't need to stay hanging on to our bitterness because there is nothing impossible with God. When you think of stories like Corey Tamboom, you think of a woman who was offended greatly, a woman who suffered much, a woman who saw her own family members die at the hands of those who hated them. Yet her story is so beautiful because she was able to forgive and she was able to forgive from the heart. And that's the point of Jesus here in Matthew chapter 18. That's the desire he has for each one of us. So brothers and sisters, as we live our lives out, we need to remember how much we have been forgiven. That the offenses against us are not near as heavy or as weighty as we have forgiven, as as we have offended God. We need to remember that forgiveness is not optional. We need to remember that we are to forgive and keep on forgiving. And that we are to remember what Christ has done for us and so live in that loving relationship with those around us. And I pray this afternoon that that would be the reality in your life and in my life. May God give each one of us here the grace to forgive as we have been forgiven with the same graciousness that God has shown to us. Not just the first time, not just the seventh time, but unto the 77th time or the 490th time. May that be true in our marriages. May that be true in our families. May that be true in our churches. And brothers and sisters, as the world looks at the church, when they see this kind of attitude, when they see this kind of forgiveness taking place, let me tell you, they're going to take notice. When they see a unity and a love and a caring, they're going to ask the question, well, what is going on? Why is there such a change? What is happening in that body? What is happening in that family? I want to know. And it's then that we're going to be able to explain to them why Jesus came to this earth. That he came not just as a baby, but he came as a savior to put us in relationship with him and to put us in a proper relationship with each other. May this be true of each one of us. May this be true of this local body. May this be true of the church of Jesus Christ today. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you, we praise you for these words of instruction to the church. And Lord, we confess that they are very difficult for us. We confess that we so quickly hold grudges, we so quickly remember offenses. We so quickly want to wrap our hands around others in anger. Lord, help us to remember our great sin against you. And Lord, how much we have been forgiven through Jesus Christ. 
And Lord, if there is a person this afternoon that does not know you, Father, we pray that today would be the day that they would come into relationship with you. That they would know the power of forgiveness, that they would know what it means not to be separated from you, but Lord, to be in a loving relationship with you. And Father, if there are relationships that are broken in our families and in our churches that need to be mended, Father, and you've reminded us of that again this afternoon, Lord, give us the wherewithal, give us the desire. Lord, give us the ability to speak about even very difficult things in the past so that in, that, in the future we may walk together. And Father, we thank you for the power to forgive. Lord, that you don't desire us to live in bitterness and anger and rage. But Lord, that you would desire us, you desire us to live walking in the Spirit, guided by the Spirit. Lord, use us in this way, we pray. Help us to see that reality in our own lives, we ask. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.